Hello and welcome to the class. Students, today we are going to discuss about STD. That is sexually transmitted disease. Introduction. Sexually transmitted diseases in short STDs are infections or diseases that can be transferred from one person to another through sexual contact. Some of the sexually transmitted infections are also transmitted through birth, infected needles or breastfeeding. The World Health Organization estimates that more than 1 million new cases of curable sexually transmitted infections that is STIs occur worldwide every day. The Government of India, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has initiated concerted efforts towards prevention of transmission of HIV infection through various strategies which are being coordinated by the National AIDS Control Organization. There is a need to allay the psychological tension and anxiety among the public due to fear of the disease as well as to dispel various myths regarding the disease among people. Efforts to tackle this problem through counseling and health education of the community should form a part of the routine responsibilities of health personnel in all settings and all levels of care. Misconceptions and fear and anxiety regarding infectivity of the patients among healthcare workers are also not uncommon. Preparing the healthcare providers to face the situation through appropriate training is one major effort been taken by National AIDS Control Organization, that is NACO. First of all, let us discuss about the historical background. Till 1981, nobody knew about this disease which has now become the second most common cause of death amongst young adults in the USA. The disease started firstly among the young homosexual in the west coast of America. Soon, the myth was removed. It was detected not only in the homosexuals but also was detected amongst the female commercial sex workers of New York who were taking addiction drugs through unsterilized needles. Soon, it was also discovered in the hemophiliacs and thalassemics children who were taking repeated blood transfusions. The disease which started in North America and Europe, that is the developed world, is now spreading in the Asian continent, especially in South Asia. Over several million Asians are already infected. HIV is clearly beginning to spread in earnest through the vast population of India and China. Since the detection of HIV infection in commercial sex workers, that is CSWs, in Tamil Nadu, India in 1986, infected number is growing very fast in the country. It is reported till September 1999, 88,775 seropositive have been reported and seropositive rate has gone up to 25.12 percent thousand. The report is from 32 states and union territories in the country. AIDS cases from these places have gone up to 8,491. More than 80 percent of all infections acquired. 90 percent of the cases were below the age of 50 years and more than two-thirds was between the ages of 20 to 40. HIV and AIDS First of all, let us know what are HIV and AIDS. HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus, a retrovirus transmitted 
from an infected person through unprotected sexual intercourse by exchange of body fluids such as blood or from an infected mother to her infant. AIDS stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. AIDS is the stage of HIV infection that develops some years after a person has been infected with HIV. Since HIV is a STD and is transmitted through the same behavior that transmits other STIs, Whenever there is a risk of STI, there is a risk of HIV infection as well. That is because almost 85% of HIV is not to be transmitted by this sexual route. Now, let us see what is the difference between HIV and AIDS. Some common possible differences may come up and can be categorized into the following three categories. A person can be HIV infected for years with no signs of illness and can continue a normal life, of course, always practicing prevention because he, she can infect another person. A person with AIDS must deal with illness that is often severe and eventually terminal. Early detection and treatment of opportunistic infections will have a positive impact on the progression of the disease. Now let us talk about STIs or RTIs. The term sexually transmitted infections that is STIs which is used in place of STDs are infections caused by germs such as bacteria, viruses or protozoa that are passed from one person to another through sexual contact whereas the term RTI stands for reproductive tract infections. It refers to any infection of the reproductive tract in male and female. Now let us see the main factors contributing to the spread of STI or RTI. Human behavior, lack of access to health care, lack of awareness about STIs or RTIs, migrant population, health care providers not adequately trained, poor medical services, hygiene and environmental factors, hormonal factors, socio-economic and other factors. Following are the common high risk and vulnerable groups of STI or RTI. Adolescent boys and girls, women who have multiple partners, sex workers and their clients, intravenous drug users that is IDUs, men and women who have to stay away from families for long, men having sex with men including transgender individuals partners of various high-risk groups, street children. Now coming to the objectives of RTI or STI case management services. Provision of quality RTI or STI case management services through a network of public health care delivery institution, private sector providers, franchisee clinics, and in TI settings will result in achieving following objectives. Enhance access to services, especially for women and adolescents who are constrained to seek services and face several access related barriers. Standardized treatment protocols will improve prescription practices by reducing polypharmacy, irrational drug combination. Focus on prevention with special reference to partner management, condom use, follow-ups and management of side effects. Emphasis on treatment, compliance and better treatment outcome. Behavior change communication leading to improved knowledge on causation, transmission and prevention of RTIs or STIs. 
ensure that providers offer counseling and testing services for HIV or AIDS and established linkages with ART systems with respect to positives. Screen symptomatic, especially contraceptives, ANC clients for STIs. Ensure service provision for groups practicing high risk behaviors such as sex workers, MSMs, and IDUs. Now let us come to preventing STIs and RTIs in adolescents and youth. Adolescents and youth in the 10 to 24 age groups constitute about 30% of our population. Data from various Indian studies indicate that adolescents indulge in premarital sex more frequently and at an early age. STIs including HIV are more common among adolescents in the 15 to 25 age group and more so among young women. Further, adolescent girls and boys are particularly vulnerable to STIs since they are less likely to have access to health services and recognize symptoms. Health services for adolescent boys are also extremely limited. Lack of education about sexual health among both boys and girls leaves them ill-equipped to make important choices to protect themselves against unwanted sex, pregnancy and STIs. The AIDS epidemic gives a new urgency to STI prevention and is also an opportunity to protect new generations from the devastating effects of AIDS by making information and services available. Now let us talk about modes of transmission. Sexual contacts with an infected partner, transfusion with infected blood, blood products, organ, tissues transplantation, and artificial insemination, contaminated syringes and needles. From an infected mother to her child that is perinatal transmission that is before, during and after delivery. Now let us talk about counseling in HIV infection. Counseling is face-to-face -face communication by which one can help the person make decisions. It aims at preventing transmission of HIV infection and providing psychological support to the already affected. Counseling is a helping process aimed at problem solving. It helps people to understand themselves better in terms of their own needs, strength, limitations and the resources they can avail of. It brings about change through a supportive relationship aiming to make the client independent through the interpersonal contract along with the opportunity to ask questions and to meet frequently and help greatly. Interpersonal communication Interpersonal communication is the face-to-face -face process of giving and receiving information between two or more people. This involves both verbal and non-verbal communication. Verbal communication. The way we talk with clients, the words we use and their meanings. Non-verbal communication. The way we behave with clients, including actions, behaviors, gestures and facial expressions. Now let us talk about guidelines for counseling. Greet the client, make him or her comfortable, listen carefully to his or her problems, do not interrupt while he or she is talking. Try to elicit more information regarding his or her problem, counsel over a number of sessions and be empathetic towards the client. Provide information on the issue for which the client has come. Help him or her to reach a decision. Time to time, reassurance and follow up regarding health condition. 
provide relevant information. Now coming to HIV transmission and sports participation. In most countries, there is an official policy of non-disclosure of HIV status. Sports participants are not under any obligation to reveal their HIV status. Although they are discouraged from participating in sports such as wrestling and boxing. The result of this policy of non-disclosure is that all injuries in the sports field are treated. All injured sportsmen and women who have bleeding wounds are sent off the fill until they have been treated and the bleeding has stopped. HIV is not transmitted through casual contact such as touching, rubbing, sharing sport equipment or utensils or using the same locker room or bathroom facilities. The virus has never been identified in sweat and has been found only rarely and in minute concentrations in saliva. Transmission does not occur through mosquitoes or other insects, through swimming in pool water or through the air. In 1989, the World Health Organization that is WHO released the following statement. No evidence exists for a risk of transmission of HIV when infected persons engaging in sports have no bleeding wounds or other skin lesions. There is no documented instance of HIV infection acquired through participation in sports. However, there is a possible very low risk of HIV transmission when one athlete who is infected has a bleeding wound or a skin lesion and another athlete has a skin lesion or exposed mucous membrane that could possibly serve as a portal of entry for the virus coming to sports and HIV first of all let's talk about non-contact sports non-contact sport includes many different kinds of exercise where there is no direct physical contact between participants during the normal course of the sport. This would include sports such as tennis, aerobic exercise, golf, cycling, running, canoeing, netball, hockey, cricket, softball and volleyball. Transmission of HIV infection in the normal course of these sports is extremely remote. Secondly, contact sports. These can be divided into low contact and high contact sports. A sport like boxing and wrestling could be classified as a high contact sport and soccer, hockey as a low contact sport. In the case of the latter, direct contact is not supposed to take place but frequently it does. Rugby, Karate and Judo etc. are some other types of contact sports. The Australian National Council on AIDS that is ANCA and the Australian Sports Medicine Federation that is ASMF recommended the following principles to help further reduce the transmission of HIV in the sports field. If a player has a skin lesion, it must immediately be reported to a responsible official and medical attention shot. If a skin lesion is observed, it must be immediately cleansed with a suitable antiseptic and securely covered. And if a bleeding wound occurs, the individual's participation must be interrupted until the bleeding has been stopped and the wound is both rinsed with plenty of water and and if dirty washed with soap then covered with a waterproof dressing
So dear students, after having all the discussions, we can conclude that sexually transmitted diseases or sexually transmitted infections and reproductive tract infections are important public health problems in India. Studies suggest that 6% of the adult population in India is infected with one or more STIs or RTIs. The prevalence of these infections is considerably higher among high-risk groups ranging from 20 to 30 percent. Moreover, STIs or RTIs are also known to cause infertility and reproductive morbidity. Controlling STIs or RTIs can be an effective intervention to reserve the HIV epidemic progress.